Thanks for your company once again today. And I hope that as you're listening to this, that you're being encouraged in your life today and in these days, day by day. These are not easy times for anyone. And I know that each one of us has our own personal set of circumstances to encounter. We do need to be mindful of those who have an even harder, pla- harder place and a harder situation, conscious of those who are alone, those who are maybe shielding, those who are anxious, those who are unwell, those who are waiting for things that seem never to come to pass because of the way they've been interrupted. So into the midst of your world, I just want to be an encourager to you today. Yesterday I was listening to a podcast called The End of the Christian Life. It's based on a book that Todd Billings wrote. Todd is a cancer sufferer and he was talking to many people in the process of writing this book helping him to get perspectives. And one of them was an undertaker and another was a theologian. And between those two men, they had an input in looking at the, the way we, we, we deal with death and the way we deal with that situation. One of the things that they mentioned was how instead of it being what was funeral as in the past, it has now become a celebration. A celebration of life where we try to find five minutes of fame for the person who has died. I fully understand the the storyline as they were talking about it, trying to help people, trying to give a a true acknowledgement of thanksgiving for the grace of God as it is deflected through the lives of those who have passed. But the concern that was also expressed about more or less pushing God out of the centre, pushing Jesus out of the centre and bringing the person into the centre seemed something slightly inappropriate for a Christian funeral. I couldn't help thinking about that in this section of scripture that we're looking at this morning, just this one verse, where Paul begins by saying, Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. It may well be that Paul is echoing the words of the Ephesians as they would shout out in their worship to their goddess Diana, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Paul is perhaps just trying to underline that no, you may think that Diana, this idol that you worship, is great. But the true greatness is to be found in this, which he describes as the mystery of godliness. And then the very next word he uses, he. He was manifested in the flesh. And so when you try to figure out what is he saying? The mystery of godliness. Grit, indeed we confess, is the mystery of godliness. The mystery of godliness seems to be the person of Jesus Christ. Because these next few sentences, which are perhaps an early hymn or an early creed, or part of a hymn or a creed, speak about the Lord Jesus Christ without actually using his name. But when you listen to them, you can hear Jesus. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. You can't read those without seeing and sensing the Lord Jesus Christ in all of them. What Paul is doing, I think, is he is putting Jesus in the centre. That's what he's doing. Now, we will see later in the next chapter that Paul talks about people putting something else in the centre. And he talks about how people will depart from the faith and devote themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. So he says that there's going to be a time coming when people will put all sorts of things in the centre. But Paul's saying it's got to be Jesus in the centre. And what what about Jesus does he talk about here? Well, it's hard to know exactly because there are different ways of understanding this. Here we have these statements, a number of statements given to us about Jesus. And could be that we have comparisons and contrasting about Jesus, his humanity and his divinity. Or it could be that they're a sort of a a narrative of his life 
beginning with his incarnation and ending with taken up into glory. Although the only thing there might be that is we would expect maybe to have his return as the conclusion. However, when you see it, it's kind of trying to figure out, and this is how sometimes in Scripture, it's not easy always to unravel the, the, the way things are presented. But yet Scripture, interpreting Scripture, I think we can get a reasonable way of understanding this. Perhaps these three couplets are contrasting Jesus. The flesh and the spirit, the angels and the nations, the world and the glory. He is, first of all, you see his revelation. He is the one we saw him in the flesh and also we see the, the work of the spirit. Manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the spirit. Two sides of his life, his humanity and then his divinity, clearly evidenced by the spirit revealing his divinity through the miracles that he did. And then, secondly, it could be the witness to Jesus in the case of the angels, and then that he's preached at among the nations, witnessed on one hand the divine witnesses, and the earthly witnesses, how the people on the earth see him and testify to him. And thirdly, when it speaks about being received in heaven and on earth, believed on in the world, that's how he's received in the world, and taken up in glory, how he's received in heaven. I'm not sure which is the exact way, but the one thing I know for reasonably sure I can say is that this is all about Jesus. This is all about the ministry, the person of Jesus, and the work of Jesus. And that is what has to be central in our lives. And so Paul says, great. This is the great, the true greatness here. In my life, I want the Lord Jesus Christ to be central. I want him to be constant and crucial to my life in every level. How am I going to do that? Well, I think there are a few things that could maybe help us. Well, I think the first thing is we're never going to, we're never going to give him that place unless we really, truly appreciate the value that Jesus is, how precious he is, how wonderful he is, how glorious he is. And in order to know that, we've got to get to know him. We get to know him through the word of God. We get to know him through our constant, conscious, earnest study of the word of God and prayerful study, meditation. We get to understand how great he is. Secondly, as we speak with him and reach out to him, talking over all of these things, asking him to reveal himself to us, to help us understand his nature, his glory, his purposes. And then we also, I think, really help to keep him central in our lives as we talk about him. What we talk about usually is something that is constantly affirmed in our lives, telling people about him, how marvelous he is and what he does for us. And finally, I think we keep him central as we worship him, giving him the love and the devotion of our hearts. And these are things we can do all the time. We don't need to be in a special place or at a special time in order to get to know him better, speak with him, tell others about him, or worship him. We can do it anywhere. Isn't that tremendous? And I hope you will. I hope you'll develop the pattern, the habit of being Christ always, Christ with you every day, Christ in the car, Christ at your work, Christ in your recreation, Christ in your thoughts. And I pray that the Lord will bless you as you do so. So thank you. And just a mention to thank you for praying for Victor, my friend who's still uh, seriously ill in hospital and still needs our prayers. And I'll update you when I have a little more to say about that. But please continue to pray for him. And do be praying for the churches at this time, conscious that, you know, I think there's there is a tendency for conflict to arise as people have different opinions on how things should be dealt with during these pandemics. And, and now, as they're selecting out groups to close and not close, we can sense the conflict that potentially exists there. You know, the devil will always try to do harm by bringing people into contention with each other. I think we really need to remember to keep Jesus central in this as well. 
Whatever glorifies Jesus most is what will guide us. Let's pray for one another that we'll have wisdom as we seek to do that and to respect one another as we do so. God bless you and I'll speak to you, God willing, tomorrow.